Okay, so I, I want to um, move on to uh, a couple of other systems, but before we do that, I, I think one of the most important things about Hydra um, is that it has the ability to do feedback. Uh, and video feedback is like a really amazing, magical thing. Um, so I didn't want to talk about Hydra without discussing um, how that works. Um, so here's an example of video feedback where I'm taking uh, the output of the graph and then I'm using it to modulate itself over time based on uh, mouse values. And so you get these totally crazy things that can wind up happening um, coming out of it. just by using the video to modulate itself over time. And so the way that this works is that when you call dot out, instead of just calling it with no arguments, you call it, um, so these are other magic things that Hydra puts on the window object. Uh, so you have 0, 0, 01, 02, 03, uh, which are just outputs. And so you basically say, I want to send the output to 0. And then when you call functions like modulate, or um, blend, or diff, or there's also things where you can specifically modulate like the hue, or the saturation, or the brightness of the images, uh, you pass in the output that you want to use to perform that modulation, or, or, or subtract from it. Uh, and so basically when this graph runs, it's taking the previous frame of video and it's using that to modulate uh, the current frame of video that's getting ready to be produced. Uh, and so you can create, I mean, yeah, it's so much better. <laughs> I could just sit here and wiggle my mouse back and forth for hours. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, yeah, it's really fun once you start playing around with the, the feedback options. Um, and then you could have other graphs that you define down here that, that maybe go out to 01, 02, and 03, and you could have feedback networks where one thing is modulating another thing that's being fed back into the first thing, and you can create really sophisticated networks of all of these video synthesis modules and how they're feeding into each other over time. Uh, so the feedback, feedback um, is, is definitely one of the coolest things about Hydra and a, a fun thing to play around with. Would it be possible to do this on a web page with like user inputs without seeing the code? Yes. Um, so you need to know. Um, do, you, have you, do you know a technology? Have you heard of something called Browserify? No. So Browserify is a system that allows you to have lots of JavaScript files that all refer to each other. And then it takes, it, it does an analysis of your JavaScript, and it takes all the files that it, it figures out that you need to run your code, and it concatenates them, it combines them into one long JavaScript file. And so then the advantage of that is that once it's just one long JavaScript file, you only have to download that one file and you don't have to worry about which file gets loaded first or anything else. Hydra uses Browserify to, to build it. And so if you want to include the Hydra, uh, it's called Hydra Synth. Uh, my understanding is that currently you have to use Browserify in order to, to do that. Um, I don't think there's a way around that at this point. It'd be nice if it was just on like a content delivery network somewhere and you could just say script, <laughs> Hydra, and be yeah. done. But I, I don't think that's currently available. Um, you should file a GitHub issue <laughs> or uh, talk to her on the live code Slack. There's a so there is a um, chat. Uh, a, um, kind of like so there was a plugin as well. Did it, there, there is a plugin? Yeah, and that's, and that's what I use to integrate into my project. So you can, you can just plug it in. As a... So what did, what did you download that as? It's just a, it's um, just a script I, file? I just, I just uh, yeah. Just... So it's, it's compiled in a way you could just include it? Yeah. OK. Last time I checked, which I didn't think was that long ago, it was more complicated than that. But that's great. That, OK, yeah, so it's already done it. 
Oh, cool. yeah, I could, um, I've done a kind of integration, um, which enables you to sort of like stuff with, with that, yeah. Cool. Um, I, I don't quite understand yet the feedback thing. Can you just... Yeah, what, so... What is Modulate doing? I mean, the feedback itself, I know that you oh, are yeah. putting and then... Uh, modulate is, is just like... I mean, you could think of it like a, a sine wave modulating another sine wave, right? So here we have a video signal that's displacing mm -hmm. another video signal over time. And can you do feedback, like normal feedback, which is just... Or you have to use it through a function? Can you, can you, which other function, for example, or so what, you can which other way can you... So uh, you the, the previous function, so I, uh, if I do diff instead of modulate, Uh, that's the result of doing that. So just subtracting the previous frame from the current frame e each time uh, to create that. Uh, there's also a blend. Mm. So this is blending the different frames together over time based on uh, the position of my mouse. Mm. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things that are like modulate only the hue, modulate only the saturation, and modulate only the brightness. Um, so if you look through the color, uh, sorry, you look through the function reference, there's a section, I think it's called modulation in the documentation where it lists all of these functions that you can use uh, with the feedback textures. What happens if you use uh, O1 there? What's the difference between O1 and uh, I don't know. O1. It's a blank. Right? Yeah, it just kind of, it, it's just black. O1 okay. is just a blank thing, so it's just it's just blending between a, a, a black texture now, so it just fades out. Hmm. All right. Let's talk about remarching uh, and the demo scene. So the demo scene is a culture that came out of, um, I'm just going to start reading it if I look at this while I explain it. Um, but uh, let's go to uh, the video example of it. Um, but, but basically what it is is a um, a movement that came out of hacking culture in the 80s. So you had all these hackers that were pirating software. They were getting together at parties because it was before the internet and there were bulletin boards and other things, but it would mostly you were like going to parties and handing people disks uh, of hacked software and trading them and whatnot. And so once they broke the copy protection for these programs, they started adding their own like audiovisual signatures to them. Um, and these became known as crack tropes. So you have your crack software, and you had like this introduction to it where it would like tell the name of the pirate that cracked the software, and like give a shout out to your friend who just had their 18th birthday, and whatever other random garbage um, they wanted to include. But the crack shows got more and more sophisticated in terms of the graphics and the audio that was associated with them over time. Uh, and so a lot of, uh, for those of you that, that do a lot of music programming, this is where a lot of the, the early tracker software um, came out of, was, was this, this particular cultural movement. Um, and eventually, the people that were doing, getting more and more into doing these audiovisual crack shows decided that that was way more interesting than cracking the software. And so they were going to kind of branch off and just make these audiovisual demos in not worry about uh, the software piracy anymore. And so that's kind of the origins of the, the demo scene. And so in the early days, they were working on very highly constrained hardware. Commodore 64 was like the main platform that people used to do this. And then eventually the Commodore Amiga. Uh, and then that led into like the PC era uh, of, of demos as well. But pretty much any of the old computer platforms, somebody has done some type of audiovisual demo work in it. And this still occurs today. So there's conferences 
I don't know if the conference isn't the right word, there's demo parties all around the world that happen where people get together and they create these audiovisual demos. They have competitions to see who can create the coolest, most interesting ones. Uh, and people do some really amazing work as part of this community. So I'm gonna show a demo here. This is one of the more famous demos that was in 2006, 2007. Um, and one important thing I should mention is that all of these demos that in, to, the day, to, to this day this remains the case, they all had their origins as being software that ran when you launched this pirated code, right? So it's not uh, videos that have been rendered out. It's everything is designed to be run in real time. So we're watching a video of a piece of software that could run in real time in 2007 on, on Windows PCs back then. And so a lot of the demo scene Aesthetic is trying to figure out how they can maximize the hardware capabilities of the different platforms that they're involved in. Uh, so we'll just watch a little bit of this of this uh, video here, maybe a, a couple of minutes. shapes and combine them together in interesting ways is another thing that it, it's, it's really good at. Being able to take one three-dimensional object and subtract it from another or make smooth transitions between different types of objects. Um, these are all things that this rendering technique kind of excels at. It's called marching.js, and it is basically um, inspired by these kind of old school demo techniques uh, and, and using this idea of ray marching. So um, how quickly can I explain this? So normally when you do graphics, like 3D graphics on the web, uh, the way it works is you actually take your geometry and you subdivide it into triangles. This is a process called tessellation. And then for each one of those triangles, you take each one of the vertices for it and you stick it inside of an array and then you push that array up to the graphics card of your computer. And then the graphics card reassembles those vertices into triangles and it has hardware that's optimized to really rapidly be able to project those triangles from 3D space into 2D space onto your screen. Um, so there's this process that, that happens behind the scenes that you're typically unaware of if you're using a library like 3JS or some other type of rendering package. But behind the scenes, everything's being subdivided in triangles. The vertices for those triangles are being organized into an array. That array is being transferred up to the graphics card, which is then reassembling all those triangles. 
And that makes it really hard to do things like take one shape and subtract it from another because you're not dealing with like pure geometry and mathematical functions. Now you're dealing with all these triangles that have been created in these vertices and what triangle belongs to what shape and how do you know which vertices you need. And there are algorithms that, that let you do all of these things, but they're expensive um, and somewhat complex to understand. So what they do in the demo scene is something completely different. Um, they ignore this idea of triangles and tessellation for geometries, um, even though it's super efficient and definitely the fastest way of rendering these types of geometries. Instead, they use this uh, technique called ray marching, where for every pixel on the screen, they kind of assume that there's a camera that's pointing uh, pointing into that scene, and they trace a ray from whatever the position of the camera is. Imagine it's just your eyes right here. The position of the camera through each pixel into the scene. And then they determine whether or not the, that ray that they've traced from, from the position of the camera into the scene, if it intersects with any of the objects in the scene, if it does, then they say, OK, tell me what the color of that particular object is. And that's the color that gets assigned to that pixel. So for every pixel on your screen, there's a ray that's being traced from the, the origin of the camera through each pixel. We're seeing if that ray strikes any uh, objects inside of the scene as it continues on into that scene. And if it does, then we're returning the color of that particular object. And this allows us to define shapes purely in terms of mathematics, um, which makes it really easy to kind of subtract shapes and do all sorts of interesting warping and uh, fun types of effects that would be really difficult if we were just using this tessellation process and, and rendering triangles up onto the screen. Um, so Marching JS is a, is a ray marcher. Uh, so we already talked about how Hydra compiles a shader behind the screen. Uh, marching JS is going to compile a shader that's going to do this ray marching for us behind the scenes. So we can just write a description of our scene in JavaScript, and it'll kind of create this ray march output for us. There's a bunch of different examples that you can like kind of browse through up at the top um, that do different things. Um, different types of weird shapes. So one of the things Ray Marching is really good at is rendering fractals. Um, so there's a couple of different fractal things inside of here to, to look at. Some of them might not show up so well on this projector. Um, and you can do things like take shapes and twist them around each other. And again, all sorts of things that would be difficult to do with triangles, but are really easy to do if you're purely defining these shapes in terms of, of uh, mathematical formulas. Um, yeah. How are they doing this? Because right now we're doing, you, I guess that's like 4GL or something. Mm -hmm. It's just one full screen fragment shader, just like Hydra. So right. there's, there's no, there is WebGL in the sense that you're displaying a rectangle and you're filling it with a shader. Just like the force, just like Hydra. But, but how were the people that were doing it in the video? And those, so they were also using shaders? Yes. Like the demo scene? Yep. Shaders. But they were, okay. Or, or some type of, they're, they're not using, they're not using OpenGL except to get some type of canvas on the screen that they can print individual pixels to. Like, because how old? My question is like, since when know. can you I actually... I mean, I don't know when the first graphics card came, but it was definitely there in 2007, for sure. But the language was similar. It's not like you know assembly, like much more lower level than shaders, or that that was like a similar. I, I think that there was the basic, the first version of the the shader language was around in two thousand seven. But I don't know. I this is mm. I wasn't doing any serious graphics programming back then, so this is mm. I don't know for sure. It's a good question. I don't know. Okay, let's do some stuff with Marching JS. So uh, the basic idea is you have the array marcher, you tell it to march some type of geometry. 
Uh, so here I'm going to say I wanted to march a sphere, and then I call dot render. Uh, if you highlight your code and then run control plus enter, um, that'll execute it, uh, or alt enter will execute a, a block of code um, that you're currently on. Uh, so that gives me a sphere. You can do other shapes, like here's a weird Julia fractal, or here's another fractal. Um, you can take the shapes and you can scale them uh, so that they're bigger or rotate them. Um, but yeah, some of the fun things that you can do, we mentioned, we saw in that other video that there was these kind of repeated fields. Uh, so I can take a sphere and I can tell it to repeat and it kind of gives me this field of spheres. Uh, and it, it's, it's hard to explain, but, but so just imagine with normal OpenGL, each one of these spheres would actually be a sphere that had been tessellated into triangles, and then each one of the triangles, all the vertices. So you have many, many thousands of vertices that are being uploaded in the graphics card in order to be able to render all these spheres. Uh, with ray marching, we don't have to think about all of that. Um, it's actually a single modulus operation inside of the shader to uh, take one sphere and turn it into uh, yeah. It's a single module. It's a modulus operation, a subtraction, and a multiplication. It's it's one very short line of code to take a shape and repeat it infinitely. Um, this actually isn't infinite because if you do infinite uh, ray marching, you will bog down your graphics card and crash. You have to kind of define a maximum distance that you want the rays to extend into a space. Um, but if I make the spheres much smaller and make the repeat distance much smaller, um, now we get the effect of having more spheres um, that extend further into the horizon, even though really we're, we're marching the same uh, maximum distance just by having more spheres and having them closer together, uh, we, we get the effect that they're more densely packed right there. And if I wanted to make this a little nicer, I could add some fog because it gets kind of noisy looking as we get further back. Uh, this is basically the strength of the fog is one, and then we have the color of the fog uh, measured as a, a VEC3. Um, how do you execute like the whole thing? Uh, you could do option enter or just highlight everything and do control enter. Oh, okay. So I'm okay. Um, so we can also define a, an animation loop that can happen to, to change this over time. Right now, it's kind of re it's rendering at maximum quality which unless you have a, a really, really, really fancy graphics card, you can't do that um, at HD resolution, 60 frames per second. So to tell it that we want it to animate at a lower quality, uh, first thing we do is we specify the quality and then we say true, which just says we're gonna animate this. For this particular sphere demo, it actually did look a little bit different. No, it didn't, okay. You can't see the difference in quality for this particular demo. Other, other demos, it's, it's easier to see. Uh, once I do that, now I can define an on-frame method. And then I can start animating things. Um, in order to animate, I need to store these things inside of variables. So I'm just going to say repeat equals repeat here. And then let's do repeat.distance. So I'm going to change the distance between the spheres. And I'll set it to, let's see, right now the distance is 0.4. Um, let's set it to whoa, um, 0.25 plus sine time times point. 1, 2, 5. So it should go between 0.375 and uh, 0.25. Um, I guess. Whoa, that's too fast. Make this a little bigger. 
Uh, so now we get this kind of animated effect that's happening. And eventually the sign will kick in and the, the spheres will start to, sort of turn around and start moving in the other direction. Or for a while it kind of just looked like they were coming towards us, but you can see they're, they're kind of getting further apart like that. Um, but I could just say equals, uh, let's, let's say point five plus time mod um, point three five, something like that. I have an arch, it's not defined, error in the console. Uh, you could turn the quality down. If, uh, so if you, if you put it at like two, I mean, that, that won't look good, but, uh, it will stop your your graphics card from exploding. H um, is not defined. Oh my goodness. What browser are you using? No, Firefox. I tried in Chrome and then I moved. Is there a are the dots on the spheres reflections of all the other spheres? Yeah. In space. Is there, is there is it so is there some kind of metallic um, materials. So yeah, it's just like the default material, but you can specify them. There's a whole tutorial on lighting and materials that you can you can go through and check out different stuff. And there's a, there's a, a sort of default environment, blue sky and horizon things that I suppose there is. Uh, that's actually just um, it's the default the default color of the material, I think. Um, there is like some type of sun, like sky dome thing, I think, but I, I don't remember the actual the details of the lighting, the default lighting algorithm, to be honest. Audio. Okay, so to do the audio, uh, you put in an f of t dot start here at the top. <laughs> Somebody's doing worse than this. <laughs> I have like a virus, so I cannot type like why so or who. So oh, I'm really? just like, <laughs> pressing and like oh, just doing God. weird stuff. Oh, so yeah, it's like a yeah. level of complexity my, my like high students swinging. Like, uh, 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 I'm gonna <laughs> not use my microphone. I'm gonna use the uh, that loopback thing that I was mentioning, and I'll play some. Bad demo. Bad demo. Sorry, I got the first one. What is record for? True? Uh, oh, so I just quality. Quality. And the 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 quality. Basically set it low to start, and then you can try setting it to higher values if it's running fast, and you feel like it could potentially run at a better quality. Um, other things you can do to make it run faster, if you have a retina display, like turn it off and set your screen to like a lower resolution. Because uh, again, the shader is running once per pixel inside the window. So if you set your screen resolution to be like, 800 by 600 or something really, really low like that, it'll run a lot faster um, than uh, what it's doing right there. So, sort of in a similar vein to... Um, to what uh, the force gives you um, in, in, in marching, you have a low, a high, and a mid. Uh, on the FFT, so it's basically just giving you three bands uh, that you can use. And there's a window size that you can change to like try and smooth things out and make it a little less crazy. It still seems pretty crazy. 
Yeah, it's maybe a little smoother. Um, and you can map this to all sorts of things, whether it's like the the folding of a fractal or these kind of repeated fields or parameters of textures that you apply to the geometry. Um, all these different things you can apply uh, just by using the f of t values and changing them to different things. inside of Jibber. Um, so inside of the, the GIST, there's a link to like a newer version of Jibber, the same version of Jibber that I used in the performance. Um, Is there documentation for marching? Yeah. There's a. What examples? Uh, so, so all these examples are up here at the top, and then there's two tutorials in this drop down oh. menu. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this help button gives you a reference oh, with mm -hmm. all the different uh, objects inside of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, inside of Jibber, there's uh, one of the, one of the, the new version of Jibber, there's a, there's a bunch of different tutorials, and one of them is for audio-visual mapping. So I just wanted to kind of show a few of those uh, really quick. So I, I guess one of the advantages, one of the things that's a little bit different about Jibber is that because you can do the audio and the visuals in the same system, you have the ability to kind of have more fine grain, granular control of what's being mapped to what. So instead of having to take an FFT analysis of an entire song and then figure that out, you can say, oh, I just want to use the kick and use the output of the kick to control this. And I just want to use the snare and use the output of the snare um, to control that. So here's a, a quick example of the, the same sphere that we were just using earlier mapped to a kick. Uh, and then I can add an offset to the, the kick and I can multiply the effect of the mapping to make it stronger. And there's kind of a shorthand to do all of that in one line of code as well. So that's the, the same. Basically, creative kick started triggering and then kind of map the radius uh, to that kick. Multiply the, out the effect by four. Um, here's an example of... Oh, same thing we were kind of playing around with earlier, repeating spheres uh, where the distance is being mapped to the, the kind of the, the road sound. Uh, but we could, we could, for example, take the road sound and use that to control the distance on the Y axis and the kick drum and use that to control the distance on the X axis and some other sound to control the distance on the, the Z axis. Uh, here's an example of using it to control uh, a texture that's on a plane. I mean, all of these examples are kind of simple to illustrate just how it how it works. Uh, this one's a little less simple. So here's a fractal with some folding, and the folding is being controlled by this synthesizer line that'll play. so easy to see with these lights. And um, 
guess this this has some the, the new version of Jibber actually lacks something that uh, the, the older version or the current version, depending on how you want to think about it, uh, has in it that I think is kind of cool. So I want to um, point that out really quick. Uh, so the normal version of Jibber is just at jibber.cc. And if you go to the tutorials, one of the tutorials is for audiovisual mappings. Um, the, the cool thing about this in Jibber is that uh, it has metadata for all the properties. Yeah. Um, so thank you, that's really cool. Yeah. But you just a lot of cool stuff. I was wondering if uh, Jibber was the first to come up with this kind of you assign, you like store your snare in a variable and like assign a visual to it. Was Jibber the first to come up with this? I think it's a pretty cool idea. Like, I, I always saw the audio variables from this FFT perspective. Uh -huh. But like, thinking they can just assign a beat to a, beat to a visual. I think, the, uh, I think there's some abstractions in there that are somewhat unique. I'm not going to come out and say for sure it's the first one to do it, but um, uh, if you send me an email, I can send you a paper that, I wrote that talks about it. Okay. And, yeah, might have some other references. Um, there was another project by Gaylor Gessel that looked at mapping. So I guess I, I stole the idea about having all the metadata to make it easy to do the mappings from him, but uh, he was mostly looking at mappings from like user interface elements to control audio parameters, mm -hmm. and so I kind of extended it, that idea to be. You can have graphical parameters control the audio parameters, you can have the audio parameters control the graphical parameters, yeah. and whatever else, which is fun. That's still cool. Yeah, I'll send you an email. Yeah, we gotta go. I'm getting the box in the